tonight at 10, the daunting challenge ahead for the economy as Britain prepares to leave the European Union. The Chancellor says business will get all the support it needs to adjust to life outside the EU, but he tells the Conservative conference that it could be a roller coaster ride as the Brexit negotiations take their course. Throughout the negotiating process, we are ready to take whatever steps are necessary to protect this economy from turbulence. And in a clear break with his predecessor, Mr Hammond is abandoning plans to balance the books by 2020. Also tonight, as the attacks on Aleppo continue, the Americans suspend talks with Russia, accusing them of targeting hospitals and aid centres. More than 5,000 migrants rescued in the Mediterranean today. We report from one of the rescue boats off the coast of Libya. These people will have been travelling for several hours now. They'll have left the Libyan coast in the darkness, unclear if they're ever going to reach their destination. Police in Paris say Kim Kardashian, the reality TV star, was targeted by an armed gang who stole jewellery worth millions. I've met the man I want to spend my life with. And for the first time ever, a film directed by a black British filmmaker is to open the London Film Festival. Here, an ultimatum from Southern Railway. Guards are told, accept £2,000 and call off strikes or face the sack. And police question a man on suspicion of the murder of a woman in Bournemouth. Good evening. The British economy faces a daunting challenge and a turbulent period as negotiations proceed for the UK's exit from the European Union. That was the warning delivered by the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, at the Conservative conference today. He also confirmed that he'd abandoned the government targets for eliminating the deficit by 2020. That was one of the principal goals of his predecessor, George Osborne. Mr Hammond said it was time for a more pragmatic approach because, he said, times have changed. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, has more details. You probably have seen him somewhere. Hello. Philip Hammond has done some of the biggest jobs in government already. But now he's the man in charge of the country's money. Dropping in on the nearest building site has long been a political staple. But some things really have changed. as the economy waits and holds its breath after the referendum. It's Philip Hammond's time and time to change. The fiscal policies that George Osborne set out were the right ones for that time. But when times change, we must change with them. So we will no longer target a surplus at the end of this parliament. But make no mistake, the task of fiscal consolidation must continue. In other words, he'll still try to balance the country's books, but isn't promising to have it done by 2020. There'll be no splurge. Spending will still be cut, but the specific timetable has gone. But this Tory Chancellor is also willing to borrow, despite his hope to get the country out of debt. Throughout the negotiating process, we are ready to take whatever steps are necessary to protect this economy from turbulence, recognising the need for investment to build an economy that works for everyone. A new plan for the new circumstances Britain faces. A Conservative government demonstrating the flexibility, the common sense and the pragmatism that has made our party the most successful political party in British history. That means borrowing. They don't look like big spenders or borrowers. It's only two billion to start with to build houses. But before the referendum, the previous chancellor, rarely seen without his high-vis jacket, would never a borrower have been. Dealing with the deficit was practically his reason for being. The big campaign claim in the general election that only the Tories would get the country out of debt. The Tories prided themselves on squeezing spending, making enemies in some quarters and fans in others. The cuts won't stop, 
But the new Chancellor wants the option of slowing down or even borrowing, because after our vote to leave the EU, he can't be sure what the country can afford. You and Philip Hammond, as Conservative cabinet ministers, are borrowing to spend. That's what Labour promised at the election. Well, remember Philip also said at the start of his speech, he acknowledges that we've still got a big uh, budget deficit, there's still a lot more work to do, but what he's saying now is that we need to be practical about bringing that deficit down. Previous Chancellor promised to deliver infrastructure to rebalance the economy towards manufacturing and to exports, it's just that he failed to deliver. It's a snub to George Osborne, isn't it? Well, um, it's different. And the point, the point I'd say about this is it's highly possible that once we're clear and established about our relationship with the European Union, that the economy itself will really grow fast. So he inherits a particular situation and has to look at it and uh, review it as he thinks fit. Uh, so if it takes a little longer, then uh, so be it. Brexit has changed tough Tory talk on the deficit. It's no longer number one. It's not the end, though, of the spending squeeze, but perhaps a pause for breath. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Birmingham. Well, during the day, the Chancellor confirmed that his autumn statement, which is due in November, will be setting out new policies, giving the government more scope to borrow to try to boost the economy. But he also warned that the job of tackling the deficit was unfinished. With his thoughts on the Chancellor's strategy, here's our economics editor, Kamal Ahmed. The Treasury run by Philip Hammond and Britain's holder of the purse strings, a department now engaged in a delicate balancing act between borrowing to support the economy post the referendum and austerity, balancing the books, cutting the deficit so the government does not spend more than it earns. Chancellor still wants to get the deficit under control, but he's not going to be able to do it as fast as, the, uh, as he was hoping or as George Osborne was hoping because he's expecting the economy to be doing less well. So he might end up spending a bit more, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to get that deficit down to zero. The UK's deficit is the gap between what the country spends and what it receives in revenues from things like taxes each year. It's been the key political battleground since the financial crisis. In 2006-07, before the financial crisis, the deficit was £36 billion. As the recession bit, tax revenues fell and spending rose and the deficit hit £155 billion in 2009-10. Now, before the referendum, it was forecast to fall to £55 billion next year and zero by 2020. Philip Hammond today confirmed that target has been abandoned. The government will borrow more to support the economy. We've seen a range of positive news. Consumers are relatively resilient, manufacturing benefiting from the lower pound. But overall, in the medium term, we're still expecting challenges there. And that would mean that for the Chancellor, there are likely to be less uh, revenue coming in and more challenges to support the economy. A tweet from an old friend wishing the new Chancellor luck. It's not really luck, of course, and the Treasury will be wary as the pound fell again today. Markets planning for Britain to leave the EU. It's a delicate balancing act indeed, as the Chancellor plots his course through this most uncertain of times. Kamal Ahmed, BBC News. Let's go live to Birmingham and talk to Laura, who's there, our political editor. So, to what extent do you think, Laura, has Philip Hammond today broken with the approach we saw under George Osborne? Well, Hugh, it's really notable that there's been a move away from the days when it felt like sorting out the deficit was the only game in town for the Tories. It was the priority above everything else. It's maybe not that surprising, though, given all the uncertainty around the economy that we've had since our referendum vote. And it's not because Philip Hammond and Theresa May suddenly woke up that one morning and thought that actually Labour's answer is the right one, to borrow for good reason in order to invest. It's more like an insurance policy that he's written for himself in case things go badly wrong during the process of untangling ourselves from the EU. He wants people to know and he believes that he might need the options of either borrowing a little bit more or slowing down the cuts if the economy needs more support. 
But interestingly, tomorrow at the conference, the Tories are going to try to turn the page. I understand there'll be an announcement from the Defence Secretary, Michael Fallon, about really squeezing down on the number of claims that are being made against British military personnel who served in Iraq. There'll also be an announcement about recruiting more doctors. Theresa May is determined that her premiership, not just this week, will not only be defined by how we leave the EU, but it certainly is the issue, the big question that's hanging in the air. Laura, thanks again. Laura Kunzberg there for us uh, at the Conservative Conference in Birmingham. Now, America has tonight suspended talks with Russia on trying to resolve the Syrian conflict. U.S. diplomats said they're responding to Russia's continued role in the assault on the city of Aleppo, where more than a quarter of a million people are trapped. Uh, the White House said that everyone's patience with R Russia had run out. A ceasefire in Syria, which started a fortnight ago, lasted just a few days, with each side blaming the other. Our correspondent in the Middle East, Quentin Somerville, has sent this report. Syria's war long ago slipped out of the hands of Syrians. In Aleppo, it means this. Rescue workers rushed to a hospital bombed today by the regime. The first victim, he's dead, they say, and move on. Searching from ward to ward, they help an injured medic. Despite talks to halt the killing, Russia and the regime are bombing civilians into submission, says the United States. And now those talks must end. Everybody's patience uh, with Russia has run out. Uh, they've also spent a great deal of credibility in making a series of commitments without any clear indication that they were committed to following them. They've been reduced to either acting unilaterally or supporting the Iranians in dropping bunker-busting bombs on civilian hospitals in Aleppo. It's outrageous. The hope had been to restore a short-lived ceasefire from last month. That died in the burnt-out remains of a UN aid convoy, bombed, says the United States, by Russia and the regime. A war crime, says the United Nations, which Russia says it didn't carry out. But a humanitarian deal, while humanitarians were being killed, looked even further impossible. In this battle, on the ground, America and Russia couldn't agree on who is friend and who is foe. Russia says America didn't do enough to separate rebels from jihadists. In the fight for the streets of Aleppo, these rebels were President Assad's enemies and Russia's too. Russian firepower has transformed the regime's fortunes. Moscow is President Assad's ally and his saviour. American and Russian diplomatic efforts have crumbled. The two sides say they'll still cooperate in the skies above Syria to prevent collisions as they target jihadists. Russia says it regrets the US decision. Wider negotiations won't end, but if Moscow and Washington can't agree to stop the killing here, then there isn't much hope of peace and an even greater risk of further catastrophe for Syria's people. Quentin Somerville, BBC News. In a moment, we'll get some more reaction. We'll talk to John Sopel, our North America editor in Washington. First, let's go to Moscow, talk to Steve Rosenberg, our correspondent there. Tell us a little more then, Steve, about the kind of reaction we've had from the Russians to this decision tonight. Well, Moscow's reaction has been pretty blunt, really, that, that Russia is not at fault here, that this is all about America breaking deals and trying to shift the blame for what's happening in Syria onto Russia. And in fact, all day, the Kremlin has been angry and frustrated with the United States. Earlier, uh, President Putin issued a presidential decree suspending a key agreement with the United States on reducing weapon-grade plutonium. That deal was to have eliminated enough plutonium for 17,000 nuclear missiles. But again, the Russians say the Americans were not following through on that. And tonight, President Putin has listed well, astonishing conditions which he says America must accept before Russia returns to that plutonium deal. He says the United States must scrap all sanctions against Russia and Russians. The United States must pay compensation to Russia. And the United States must reduce the number of US troops in all countries that join NATO after September 2000. That is not going to happen. Steve, thanks very much. Let's go straight to Washington and talk to John there. We've had increasingly angry statements from Mr Kerry in recent days, John. So was this decision tonight inevitable? 
Yes, I think it was, Hugh, and I think that, frankly, the, the agreement lasted longer than many people had probably expected, particularly after the bombing of that aid convoy. And there has been a deep sort of scepticism about what the Russians are doing. The uh, State Department saying that they were either unwilling or unable to ensure Syrian regime adherence uh, to the arrangements. And it just shows, as we heard from Steve, how parlous the state of relations are between Russia and the United States. I think the other striking thing about this is the total lack of leverage uh, that the Americans seem to have over the Russians. The statement from the State Department, you would expect, would have a final paragraph, something along the lines of, and unless Russia does this, then X, Y or Z will follow. Instead, there is nothing. And it's as though they've taken the dictum of the former uh, US President Teddy Roosevelt, who said the key to diplomacy is to speak softly but carry a big stick. America at the moment, as far as Russia is concerned, seems to be speaking softly and carrying no stick at all. John, thanks very much again. John Sopel there with the latest there in Washington and Steve Rosenberg for us in Moscow. Now, migrants are continuing to make the dangerous journey across the Mediterranean uh, while the waters are still relatively calm. Some 5,500 people were rescued today alone. But they're arriving in a Europe where countries are closing their borders and where public opinion is hardening. Nearly 3,500 are believed to have died in the effort to cross the sea this year and more than 600 children have drowned in that same period. My colleague Rita Chakrabarti is on board one rescue boat led by the charity Save the Children and we can join her now. Thank you, thank you. Well, I've been on this rescue ship for several days now. I've been on this rescue ship for several days now, and forgive me, Hugh, I'm battling against the sound of the ship's engine a little bit. I'm in the middle of the Mediterranean, and behind me there is a sea of people on the deck. You can probably see mostly asleep now. Over 200 migrants who were picked up by this rescue ship yesterday. They are, though, only a fraction of the thousands of people who made the perilous journey just today, undeterred, it seems, by the dangers they were exposing themselves to and also by the potential reaction they might get once in Europe. Scanning the horizon in the early morning when the sea reveals its human cargo, the migrant boats set out at night so the owners won't be caught. A vessel comes into view with around 100 on board. There's no orange to be seen, meaning no life jackets. The team scrambles to get the small rescue boats on the water. Please stay calm. Please stay calm, s'il vous plaît. The people look stunned. They're given life jackets to make them safe. Over 300,000 people reached Europe across this sea this year. Over 3,000 have died doing so, all been reported missing. The people have been quite calm until now, but they're clearly getting a bit agitated and the rescuers are having to tell them to sit down, to stay calm, that they will all be rescued. These people will have been travelling for several hours now. They'll have left the Libyan coast in the darkness, unclear if they're ever going to reach their destination. On the rescue deck and safe. There are smiles, relief, but no celebration. The group is entirely male and mostly from West Africa. This young man is among them. He didn't want to be identified. He's come from the Ivory Coast, which he left four years ago because of unrest. He says he's experienced kidnap and forced labor and hopes Europe will welcome him. But I ask him, what if it doesn't? We are all human beings, whatever the color of our skin. We don't do this because we really want to. We do this because we have to. If only people would welcome us, because we are not there to harm them. The conditions in which we find ourselves are really unfavorable. And now there is effectively a second rescue going on. There is another humanitarian mission ship over there. It's already transporting migrants and about a hundred of them are being transferred from that ship to this one. There are women this time, some of them looking shattered by what they've been through. The majority of these people are from Somalia. One is this 16-year-old girl escaping a forced marriage. She's been travelling for 10 months and wants to study medicine and then go back. 
Italy, where the boat is heading, will let her stay until she's 18. But what then? I pray for the best. If you don't like me, maybe you have your own reasons. And maybe I may be different from others. Or I may be the same like others. How you take me, it's, it's you to decide. The flimsy vessels that deliver people here are destroyed by the rescuers so that they can't be reused. But more keep coming. As for their occupants, they face an uncertain future in a Europe uncertain that it wants them. Rita Chakrabarti, BBC News, off the Libyan coast. Well, let's have a brief look then at some of the day's other news stories now. Southern Railway says it will terminate the contracts of conductors unless the RMT union accepts an offer aimed at averting further strikes by Thursday. The company says the ultimatum is a final attempt to end the dispute over working practices, which has caused months of disruption for passengers travelling between London and Surrey, Kent, Hampshire and Sussex. The Republican US presidential candidate Donald Trump has been told that his charitable foundation must stop fundraising in New York State. The Attorney General there says that the foundation wasn't properly registered. Mr Trump's office said it was concerned that the investigation was politically motivated, but then it did promise full cooperation. The Caribbean is bracing itself as one of the most powerful hurricanes for a decade moves across the region. Hurricane Matthew could bring winds of over 150 miles an hour. Haiti is expected to suffer the most damage and parts of Jamaica have already been hit. Now, the Nobel Prize for Medicine has been awarded to Dr Yoshinori Oshumi from the Tokyo Institute of Technology for his discoveries about how the body recycles old and defective components and experts say that it is a process that helps to explain what leads to diseases such as cancer and dementia. Now, work has already started to try to rescue a peace deal between the government of Colombia and the rebel gr group that is known as the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC. Uh, the deal, which uh, took four years to negotiate, was narrowly rejected by voters in a referendum yesterday. The rebels say that they are prepared to review the terms of the deal, which would end more than half a century of conflict in the country. Our correspondent, Wira Davis, is in Bogota with the latest for us. Well, Hugh, there's a huge sense of shock and uncertainty across Colombia tonight, here in Bogota, the capital, and across this vast nation, after a vote that many people thought was a mere formality to bring an end to the world's longest-running guerrilla insurgency. But the people of Colombia, the 40% of people who voted, rejected the deal between the government and left-wing guerrillas. And the big question is, what happens now? Yes. It was all too much for some. After more than 50 years of civil war, this was meant to be the moment of hope, the realisation of a dream that finally the bombs and the guns would be put down in exchange for peace. But by less than half of 1%, the people of Colombia rejected the deal. President Juan Manuel Santos had repeatedly warned there was no plan B, but he vowed not to let his peace plan die so easily. I won't give up. I'll continue the search for peace until the last moment of my mandate, because that's the way to leave a better country for our children. Only last week, after four years of difficult talks, President Santos and leaders of the Marxist FARC guerrilla movement had signed the historic agreement before an approving audience of world leaders. All that remained was the endorsement of the Colombian people. A formality, thought most observers. But many Colombians were deeply unhappy about concessions made to the guerrillas, who've been fighting a leftist insurgency since the 1960s. A war in which more than 200,000 people have been killed, thousands raped or kidnapped, and millions forced to flee from their homes. Why, asked the No campaign, where they're now being offered a deal that would see FARC leaders standing for Congress rather than being punished for war crimes. For the last few months, thousands of FARC guerrilla fighters have been gathering in their jungle camps, preparing to demobilise. The result has left both sides wondering what to do now. But having spent years negotiating the peace, FARC leaders say they have no appetite for a resumption of violence. We reiterate our commitment to use only words to construct the future. 
Both the government and guerrilla leaders say they will honour an existing ceasefire agreement. But the real concern here is there will be an inevitable return to violence, just as happened when previous peace talks collapsed. For now, there's despair among the millions of Colombians who thought this civil war had finally come to an end. Wada Davis, BBC News, Bogota. Now, in Paris, police say an armed gang who broke into an apartment and robbed the reality TV star Kim Kardashian West were very well prepared and left with millions of pounds worth of jewellery. Uh, the robbery took place in the early hours of this morning. Uh, Ms Kardashian West had been in the city uh, for Paris Fashion Week. Our correspondent Lucy Williamson reports there is some flash photography coming up. It's not hard to know where Kim Kardashian is. Last week, her fans, followers and photographers signalled her arrival in Paris. Today, it was police, not paparazzi, on the steps of her luxury apartment. Investigators now occupying the rooms where one of the world's best-known celebrities was held up and robbed in the early hours of this morning by men dressed as police. Police have told us that the five men broke in here last night and handcuffed the security guard, forcing him to show them the apartment where Kim Kardashian was staying. Once inside, they held a gun to her head as they robbed her of jewellery worth almost £8 million and then tied her up and locked her in the bathroom while they escaped. A police official said the robbers had been well prepared. The gunmen were informed and very likely seasoned robbers. Nothing was left to chance. They wore police-styled jackets, balaclavas, so they wouldn't be recognized if caught on CCTV footage. Her husband, the rapper Kanye West, heard the news while performing in New York last night. Family emergency, I have to stop the show. <laughs> Family emergency, he says. I've got to stop the show. And breaking overnight, Kim Kardashian robbed... As Kim Kardashian flew back to the US today, morning shows broke the news to America. She was badly shaken, her spokeswoman said, but physically unharmed. On social media, some joked about the attack or accused her of self-promotion. Others urged sympathy for her as a wife, a mother, a daughter and friend. The woman whose celebrity was built on broadcasting the private life of her family today chose privacy in the face of a very personal ordeal. Lucy Williamson, BBC News, Paris. Now, for the first time ever, a film directed by a black British filmmaker, Ama Asante, is to open the London Film Festival when it starts on Wednesday. Called A United Kingdom, it tells the story of the first president of Botswana and his wife, Ruth Williams. Their mixed marriage was frowned upon back in 1940s Britain and it prompted quite a diplomatic crisis. Elaine Dunkley has been speaking to Ama Asante about the film and about her career. I am told that you no longer wish for me to honour my duty as your king because of the colour of the wife I have chosen. A United Kingdom, a film based on the true story of a marriage that shocked the world, rocked the establishment and the empire. I love this land, but I love my wife. Um, creatively, it's a fascinating story. What happens when the intimate story of two people falling in love happens uh, against a huge political backdrop, um, the backdrop of an empire. But also, there are, there are all these details in the film that I haven't been allowed to previously see on screen as a, a, a black woman growing up in Britain today. And so I was really aware of the young, privileged African men who were running around London in the 1940s, you know, in their trilbies and their overcoats, um, many of whom were going to go back to their countries and be part of walking their countries into independence during that period. Do you feel accepted as a British director or do you still get that question where are you really from? No, actually it's very interesting. Once I became uh, a little bit known as, as a director, um, it, uh, I was kind of claimed in many ways. Um, I became uh, understood as somebody who's British, particularly because I think my stories are able to express something of what it is to be bicultural. My father, he wouldn't approve. The language in your films very bold when it comes to issues around mm. race. Mm. Has that been influenced by your upbringing? Yeah, I mean, I, li I lived in a very explicitly 
negative world when it came to race. I remember a time walking home from the cinema in, um, from Streatham Hill with my sister and having bottles thrown at us. We were one of just two black families um, living on, on the street that I lived in, in Streatham. And so we, we were very unusual in many ways and we were reminded of that regularly. You've been recently invited to vote as part of the Oscars and there was a whole issue around diversity at the Oscars. Yeah. Is there a will to change and will things change? This has to be a many pronged attack. We have to start changing within the industry and of course when we do and when those films are presented to Oscar voters, we have to judge them fairly. Do you ever get those pinch me moments? And when was the last time you had one of those? I'm walking down the red carpet for the premiere of my film the first time, you know, with my dad. Um, and that was at the London Film Festival 12 years ago. I'm very lucky and um, yeah, right now it's sort of every other day I'm kind of pinching myself. The stories from the past are being given a new vision, a breakthrough for black British history on the big screen. Elaine Dunkley, BBC News. Uh, Amma Asante there talking to, to Elaine about the, the film, um, A United Kingdom, which opens the uh, film festival uh, later this week. A uh, quick reminder, Newsnight is about to begin on uh, BBC Two with more from the Conservative Conference in Birmingham. Here's Evan. We're here at the Conservative Party Conference in Birmingham and the party has been criticised for not having a Brexit plan. Question is, does it have one now and does it make sense? Join me now on BBC Two, 11pm in Scotland. That's Evan uh, with Newsnight here on BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.